Hey, what's up guys? This is part four of my series on how to record drums. And in this video, I'm gonna go over how to set up your DAW for recording. Now, I use Logic Pro 10 pretty much exclusively now, so I'll be demonstrating everything with that. But all the things I'm gonna cover apply to other DAWs as well. They just go about it in slightly different ways, but the principles are pretty much the same. Okay, so let's get started. All right, cool, let's just go and start from scratch. So we'll go to Logic, go to File, new from template, and we'll just start a uh, new empty project. In the settings here at the bottom, just make sure that your input and output are set to your audio interface. I have to use the built-in output right now because I'm doing a screen flow, but I usually have that set to uh, Sapphire as well. For the sample rate, I just keep mine set to 44.1 because I'm recording so much content now for the channel. That just helps me to save on some hard drive space. But if you're recording a more professional project, then you may want to take that sample rate up, but I just keep mine set to 44.1, okay? So we'll open the project. And the first thing we get is this uh, menu to create some tracks. So when I'm recording my lesson videos, I usually use nine tracks because I have a vocal mic and a click track. But if I'm only recording drums, I really only need seven tracks. So I'll just make that seven. And I don't really worry about any of these settings here except for the output. Just make sure that's set to output one and two. Okay, so we'll create our tracks and expand them out a little bit here. And the first thing I like to do is just go through and rename the tracks. So start the top, kick, snare, rack tom, floor tom, overhead left, overhead right, and front kick. Okay, now the next thing I like to do is change all the track icons. This is just a uh, visual thing, but I think it looks cool and I like it, so I do it. So just select the kick track, go to icon and drums. We'll make that the kick. Do the same thing for the snare. And rack tom. Floor tom. Overhead left. Overhead right. And for the front kick, I just keep that as a uh, condenser microphone. Okay, uh, now the next thing I like to do is configure the track headers here to only have the options I really want. So to do that, we can just right click on it, go to configure track header. And I like to turn off the control surface bars, keep the numbers, turn on the color bars, keep the icons. For the uh, buttons, the only ones I really need are mute solo and record enable. So I'll turn off input monitoring and I'll keep the uh, volume and pan. Okay, so that just kind of condenses our track header down to only the options I really wanna see. Now the next thing I like to do is color the tracks. So to do that, just select all the tracks, hit option C to bring up the color palette. And I just keep mine set to a dark red. You could potentially make yours whatever color you'd like, but I just keep mine set to dark red. And the last thing I like to do is uh, condense the channel strips in the mixer to the only things I really want to see. So to do that, we'll go to View, Configure Channel Strip Components. So I don't need audio device controls, don't need the settings menu, MIDI effects, automation, or control surface bars, okay? So that just kind of condenses the mixer down to the only elements I really want to see. So uh, that's basically all the initial changes I make whenever I create a new project to keep everything neat and organized. Now the next thing we need to do is set the track inputs. Okay, so to set the track inputs, we can just go into the mixer, go to input, and we get this drop down menu that shows us all the inputs from the interface. And right now they're just labeled one through 28, which is fine, you can leave it like that if you know where all of your inputs are but I personally prefer to label them so I know exactly what's what. So to do that, we can go to Mix, I.O. Labels. And right here on the left, we have all the inputs. And on the right side, we can set custom labels for all of them. So I know that my first input is the kick. And snare. Rack tom. Floor tom. Overhead left, overhead right, 
and the front kick, okay? So now when we go back to the inputs, everything is nice and labeled for us so we know exactly what's what. So now we can just match everything up. So kick goes to the kick, snare goes to the snare, rack tom, floor tom, overhead left, overhead right, and front kick. So this uh, can become more important if you create your tracks in a different order than what your inputs are. Uh, so that's why I like to set the I.O. labels is so I know exactly what input is supposed to go to what track. Okay, so the last thing you want to do is just make sure that your outputs are set to stereo output 1 and 2. And that should be good for setting all the inputs and outputs. Now the next thing we need to do is group the tracks. Okay, so the reason you want to group the tracks is so you can record enable all the tracks without having to individually go to each one. And also any edits you make to the tracks will affect all of them at once, okay? So to set a group, we'll just select all of our drum tracks here in the mixer, go to group, set that to group one. And the group settings are up here in the top left. So we'll rename that to the drums, and you can see that that changes them all here in the mixer as well. And there's a drop-down menu under here with some options. Now the only ones I like to keep enabled are editing, turn off phase-locked audio, turn these off, and record. So now what that allows me to do is I can just hit record on one of the tracks and it record enables all of them. I can still go through and solo and mute individual tracks if I want, but the recording goes for all the tracks at once, okay? Also, if I want to uh, make some edits, let me just record something real, real quick here. If I go through and I need to make edits, it affects all the tracks at once, okay? So that's the reason why I like to group the tracks. Now, the way this is set up is perfectly fine for uh, recording yourself playing solo or recording a practice session or something like that. But if you need to play to a song, let's say you want to do a cover, or someone sends you a track to play on, then we need to import that audio and configure a few different things. Okay, if we want to play to an audio track, then we first need to create an audio track. So to do that, we can just use the shortcut Option Command A, and that creates our track here. We can just bring it to the top, rename it something like Track, and now we need to import the file we're going to play to. There's a couple ways you could do that. You could either go to a finder window and drag it in manually if you know where it is. I personally prefer to use the built-in file browser that's over here in Logic. So you could either uh, drag something in from your iTunes library if it's in there, or you can navigate to it manually under all files. So I'll go to this project I'm working on with one of my friends, and uh, this is a song that he wants me to play on. So I'll just go ahead and pull it into the audio track here and give it a second to process. Okay, so all of the changes I like to make whenever I import an audio track are gonna be in the global track settings. So to get to that, we can just hit this little button right here and that drops down our global tracks. So the only ones I really need are marker, signature, and tempo. So we'll start with tempo. And I know that this track is at 188 beats per minute. So I could either drag this line up to 188 or I can just go here to the top and type in 188. So we'll turn on our metronome here and make sure that this matches up. Cool. Okay, and uh, next thing we'll do is look at the time signatures. Now, this particular song is in 4-4, so I can just leave it as 4-4, but if you have a song that changes time signatures, then you would wanna go through to where those time signature changes are and create a new signature there. So let's say this would be seven, eight, maybe it goes to, I don't know, 15, 16. But you would want to go all the way through the song and map out all the time signature changes. And the reason you want to do that is so the metronome and the grid of logic match the song that you're playing, okay? So map out your time signatures. And then the other thing I like to do is go through and put markers uh, for all of the important sections of the song. And the way that I like to do it is I actually like to set the marker 
two bars before the section I'm actually trying to mark. So for example, the song starts right here on bar seven. So on bar five, I would actually set a marker and call it something like count in. So now when I play back from that marker, it gives me uh, two bars before the section starts. So that just gives me a little bit of time to prepare before I actually need to start playing that section. So that's the method I use for creating markers. And I would go through the song, find all the important sections, say like verse, we'll say chorus, you know, etc. And uh, I would go through and color the markers. So to do that, just bring up the color palette with option C. So I would make this one like green, blue, red. And the reason why markers are important is if you need to uh, navigate quickly through the song or you need to go to different sections to rehearse, you can actually just use the number pad to quickly go around to different parts of your song, okay? So that's why I'm a big fan of using markers. So once we have that, we can collapse the global tracks. And now we should be good to go. So we could start at the count in, record enable our tracks, hit the R button to record, and we would be good to go. Okay, so the last thing I wanna talk about that's pretty important is how you plan to monitor yourself whenever you're recording. Okay, so one of the things that's really important whenever you're recording yourself is how you plan to monitor your mix. Now there's a couple different ways you could do this. The method that I prefer is to actually use the zero latency software that's included with my interface. So the way this works is it just completely bypasses the audio going to the DAW and back and just routes it straight to my headphones. So that way I get a zero latency mix of the drums with no echo or anything. So I really prefer this method. If you don't have an interface that offers this, then you may need to uh, monitor yourself inside the DAW. So the way that works in Logic at least is you can activate the software monitoring button right here, or you can navigate to the audio preferences, go to general and activate it from there. So whenever you have this turned on and you record enable your tracks, you'll be able to monitor yourself. So the disadvantage to this method is it's going to introduce some latency into your headphone mix. So the way to control that is to go back to the audio preferences again. And your IO buffer size is, what, is what's going to control your latency. So the lower you go, the lower your latency is. And the higher you go, the higher it's going to be. So your goal is to keep this as low as possible. But the trade-off to this is that the lower you go, the more processing power it's going to require from your computer. So if you set this at 32 and it sounds good in your headphones and you start recording and you start getting error messages or clicks and pops and stuff like that, then most likely it's too low and you're going to need to uh, take that up a little bit. So you'll need to do some trial and error to see what works for your own system to see how low you can go but you want to try to keep that as low as possible. Ideally though, the zero latency software I think is where it's at. So if you can get an interface that offers that, I think that would be ideal, but I just want to make you aware of both of those options. All right guys, hopefully that kind of gives you some ideas for how to set up and organize your sessions to get ready for recording. Eventually you'll develop your own templates and methods that work for you, but hopefully this can kind of be a guide for you if you're new to recording. So that's gonna do it for part four. In part five, I'm gonna go over how to set levels and start tracking. So go ahead and subscribe to the channel and I'll see you guys in the next one. Take care. <laughs>